all 40 pounders are an iconic bird. They're a symbol of nature's power and beauty. They were headed for extinction in the 1980s when agencies and nonprofit organizations got together to save them. They captured every wild condor and put them in a captive breeding program, and condors are now making significant progress toward recovery. The effort put into their recovery is a testament to the fact that we can overcome obstacles and protect the earth. Even when extinction seems imminent, we can work together to save the world. Green Space is working to protect the landscape and the entire ecosystem in which condors make their home. Joe Burnett, our speaker today, is a representative. He's a wildlife biologist from Vantana Wildlife Society, another nonprofit working to save the condors. And we're very grateful to the UUs for letting us use this lovely room to, to uh, welcome you all to hear about the condors today. Uh, Joe is here also with his interns, Dana and Mackenzie. And Joe is happy to answer questions after he's finished with his presentation. Joe? Thank you. Is that supposed to come up on the screen? That's what I make sure. Thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm Joe Burnett. I'm a senior wildlife biologist with the Natana Wildlife Society. Um, again, we have Dana and Mackenzie here today. Uh, Dana and Mackenzie spend the majority of their time with the San Simeon flock. Um, how many folks here have seen or encountered the birds since we've started releasing in the area? Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, they made uh, quite the splash uh, around some of the neighborhoods around here when they were poking around some pine trees and we were getting some funny calls and uh, you probably ran into other staff uh, listed up here. Melissa Clark or Amy List, our other two biologists, um, were out and about last season when we were releasing. And uh, yeah, these young birds are curious when they go out and they're exploring their environment for the first time. So. Uh, they're kind of like humans in that they, they kind of explore the area and they're, they're, it's kind of looking in a mirror sometimes. They're as curious with you as yours with them. And, uh, and that's a strategy these birds need to have because they are scavengers. So, um, let me see, make sure. So today, uh, here's a little background about us. Uh, Ventana Wildlife Society got its start uh, with bald eagles. Uh, we did a similar project to the condors in that we released 70 eagles between 85 and 94, and we now have over 30 nesting pairs in Central California. Wow. They, were, they were absent for over 60 years. Wow. Um, and it was our first attempt at reintroducing a species and we found out it worked. Mm -hmm. And so Fish and Wildlife Service, who is our, basically who we report to, uh, asked us to give the California condor a try, which was a, a daunting task. Uh, also, Ventana isn't just uh, wildlife, we also do natural science education, and it's a powerhouse program we have. We do natural science day camps in the summer, we do after school programs throughout the year. We have a whole education wing. Um, I think there's more staff in our, edu in our education program than there are on the Condor. Um, again, it's a very, it's been going since 1992, <coughs> going strong. Uh, a lot of our education programming is based out of Monterey, Big Sur. Um, that's where our main office is in Monterey, and then obviously our field work is Big Sur and San Simi. Um, we began releasing condors in 1997. We're the only nonprofit releasing condors in California, and we, we wear that uh, badge of honor. <laughs> it's it's not it's it's rare that that happens, but I think we're a key contributor to the to the work, having that private nonprofit approach, working with all these other government agencies. So. Um, yeah, we started uh, in 97 in Big Sur. We brought on Pinnacles in 2003 and helped them get, get going, get their release project going. So we kind of we kind of sistered that project for a while. We still work with them very closely. And then we just expanded to San Simeon in 2015. Um, and I'll explain the reasons why we did that later. Um, some other big projects we have going on uh, are DD-induced uh, eggshell thinning research, uh, the condors that are on the coast, are foraging on the coast, and there's some hazard and threats there. And the biggest issue I'll talk about, and this is a program we have now that's gotten really strong, is our free non-line ammunition program that we began in 2012. And I'll get a lot, way into more detail. I probably put way too many slides in my talk today, but I just 
I don't want to cut you guys short. <laughs> There's just too much cool stuff going on, too many uh, milestones we've reached, and it's come a long way. Um, this is just kind of a visual of what Vitana has been and continues to be. Uh, we still monitor the bald eagles, and now we're, we're, we're neck deep with condors, and obviously the education part of it, the outreach fund, is probably the most critical part of all everything we do. So they all work together. So today, I, I want to start, I know everybody here that might be preaching to the choir about some of the condor biology, but I know some folks um, don't know a lot of the background, the basics about condors. And then I'll go over the timeline of how we got to where we got, you know, how the condor almost went extinct and where we are now. Uh, go over the releases that have happened over the last 20 years. Uh, and then just give an update, current status, new developments. And then Mackenzie and Dana will come up and talk about our newest batch of San Diego members that are ready to get set loose here in about two, three weeks. So it might be in a neighborhood near you very soon. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna get started. There's a lot of info here. I'm gonna probably skim through some of it, but um, again, this is if this is uh, preaching to the choir, don't worry about it. We'll get to the good stuff at the end. California condor, it's North America's largest flying land bird. Um, nine to 10 foot wingspan. They can weigh anywhere. We had birds as light as 16, as heavy as 25. Uh, that's kind of a rough range. That feather gives you some perspective. That feather she's holding is the tip of that wing. Wow. That's one of the primary feathers, and they can pass it around. It's Nature does it best. I mean, they build durable. Um, condors cycle these out about every year and a half, and they asymmetrically molt. If they molt it at all the same time, obviously that wouldn't be good for them. <laughs> they would be able to fly. So they do this, they call it asymmetrical molting. Um, and those are, the, those are the key to their survival. Uh, I mean, NASA can't replicate what nature has done with condors. Uh, those big wings allow them to use thermals and at, at a high, high efficiency, and they can conserve energy incredibly well. Um, condors are very long-lived. Uh, we actually don't know how long they can live. In captivity, there's a condor that's over 50 years old. Um, in Andean condors, their cousins in South America have lived in captivity in their 70, years, 70 or 80s. Wow. So we're pretty confident they live in the wild, they're exposed to more the environment through probably 50, 60 years. Pretty solid, so similar to humans. And they breed very slow. Condors lay one egg every other year. And the best way to describe it, the size of a condor egg is a Haas avocado. It's exactly about a half pound. And she'll pass it around. It's, uh, this color matches it for, God, I thought I turned off my phone. Sorry about that. Um, and it weighs about a half pound. They incubate that egg for 57 to 60 days before it hatches. So they spend two months just mom and dad switching off and on. Um, and that egg hatches and then they spend six months with the chick in the nest until it basically leaves the nest and fledges and then they spend another year with the chick shown at the ropes. So very long lived, very slow breed. So a species like this is very vulnerable any spikes in mortality, if they have a few bad years, it's kind of a big deal because they can't breed like a lot of other smaller species that can breed fast and catch up. Um, and they're scavengers, all they get scavengers. So there's nature's, they're nature's recyclers. They're going around getting the stuff no one else wants to eat. I'll get into more detail on that. Uh, condors are pretty complex behaviorally. Uh, the males do this uh, elaborate courtship dance. Uh, you have to see it to believe it. It's <laughs> definitely pretty impressive. And sometimes the females like it, sometimes they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a hit or miss. You know? but we have some young males that like to display to every female they see. And they figure, you know, I guess they figure it's an odds thing that yeah. actually <laughs> want to put on the bike. <laughs> no, but it is a really cool, it's a, it's a really cool ritual that we look forward to. It's going to be coming up in the next couple months. And, uh, it's, it says a lot to their behavior. And, um, condors make no vocal, I mean, they don't have vocal cords, so a lot of their communication is nonverbal. Um, they can make hiss and grunt sounds like a lizard or more reptilian generated, but they actually don't have any other communications, uh, body language and head coloration, and showing those bright wing patches. These guys are built for survival. Condors are tough. Personally, I think they should be the national bird. They put the bald eagles to shame um, because they can survive anything. 
They can exist as far north. Condors once existed up in British Columbia and as far south as desert Mexico. So these guys can persist in the most extreme environments and pretty well, pretty much not just a beat. So they have, they're equipped with some cool stuff. The eyesight, obviously, is very important. If you're a scavenging bird and flying over great distances, you need to be able to find your food. They also have a really keen sense of smell. Not as good as a turkey vulture, but better than most animals on the planet. So they're using that sight to maybe find turkey vultures that have found food that they can boot them off. <laughs> the turkey vultures are about a third the size of a condor. So the turkey vultures are cool though because they can let the condors feed and then they can come back and feed. They're on, we call it on vulture time. You know, they're just kind of just cruising around. Uh, Condors have a large wingspan with those beautiful white underwing patches. That's probably the most key identification mark when you're out seeing them in the wild. More prominent on the adults, but you can see it's almost powder white. And it's really obvious when you see them out flying around. And the tag up there helps too. <laughs> uh, but those large wingspans, just the amazing ability to conserve energy. They can lock those wings. They're nature's perfect glider. They can soar all day. Just exerting. You're not going to see them flapping a lot. It, that's that's a bad pattern for them to get into because they're going to use a lot. You see younger birds doing that, but the adults are dialed in. They will they will not flap if they don't have to. The crop. This is basically the the uh, condor's natural storage pouch for food. They can put up to three four pounds of meat in there. Oh. Rotting meat. <laughs> And they can go, we've had condors go easily three weeks to four weeks without feeding that we know of. So they're designed, if they need to, if they get caught in some of these big coastal storms that come in, and they never get a window out to feed, they can persist on that food and that crop for weeks. It's a really cool survival strategy. Sharp beak. If you're feeding on dead stuff along the coast from whales to sea lions, you need a sharp beak to cut through the thick hide. In England, they're feeding on cattle, deer, elk, anything. They're going for the megafauna. They're going for the big stuff. But they will also won't pass up a squirrel either. So they're pretty opportunistic. But condors in their role, their niche in the scavenger world is to get into those big carcasses and open them up. Because you figure a turkey vulture shows up, it can't get in there, it's not going to get anything. So it's just, they have a symbiotic relationship with condors. Condors show up, kick them off, but that condors open up that whole carcass. And the turkey vultures can come in later and go into places where condors couldn't get to. So it's a really cool thing to watch. <laughs> Big feet. Um, their feet actually aren't white. They're uh, pink like their crop. Anybody tell me why their feet are white? They urinate on their own feet. Yeah, they poop on their legs. <laughs> There's another way to say it. They call it urohydrosis, which I think is one of the coolest words. <laughs> if there were any kids in the audience, that would be their lesson of the day. Remember what urohydrosis is. But they also do it to cool off, to help thermoregulate body temperature. Because if they're in a hot, hot place, it's a great way for them to cool down. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Condors it works. And it supposedly sterilizes their legs, because their legs are always, and feet are always walking around in bucky, disease kind of ridden places. So it's a way of self-sterilizing their feet. And their talons are not talons, they're more like toes. They can still grip a perch and grab them by a tree, but they're not designed to kill prey like, like you see the Freddy Krueger style piercing of a, talons of a golden eagle or a bald eagle. Condors are really designed for walking and for gripping perches and for anchoring against when they rip with their beaks. And they have incredibly strong neck muscles. So when we handle them to put tags on, the first thing I, we teach these guys is watch out for the beak <laughs> and watch out for their feet because uh, they get leverage off those feet and they can get their beak free and then they start rendering flesh from us. So wow. that's that's the business end of the bird. So which one is a common? They're both condors. The one on the right is an adult, that beautiful, brilliant colored head there. And then the fluffy, darker head one on the left is a recently fledged bird. This bird doesn't even have tags on yet. And uh, yeah, it's because we get calls a lot of people, oh, I saw a condor that had a dark head. And it's like, oh, they, you know, the juveniles will have a dark head. They don't get the uh, brilliant colored head there until they hit about five years old. And then they begin breeding between six and eight years old. So 
but again, long-lived. I mean, they have to survive six to eight years even to start producing their own young. Mm -hmm. So it's a, quite a um, thing. What do they eat? This is the photo. It's definitely the, it's a little graphic, but it is what they do. You know, pounders are the cleaner, cleaner uppers of the animal world. <coughs> And uh, you know, basically, you have a carcass maybe on a ranch that's diseased or maybe picked up a disease. If a, condor, a group of condors come in and feed on it, they are in a sense clean up, ridding that carcass of disease. What goes in gets pulverized in their digestive tract, which is their digestive system has a pH that can melt nails. You know, <laughs> um, you ever see that? It's I always tell people it's like when you put a nail in a, a glass of coke and the next day it's dissolved. That's what condors do. I mean, they have a they have an iron gut, and it's and it's there for a reason, you know, naturally, to kind of help recycle out some of these bad things that come along. And again, they digest some of the most wretched naturally occurring biotoxins, E. coli's, uh, botulisms, all sorts of stuff. So they, they have a really good role. I love this part. <laughs> How do condors communicate? Out, yeah, how do condors communicate? Out in the field, um, again, I told you they don't vocalize, but in the field we refer to them as flying primates. They're controlled by a really strict pecking order, um, a very strict hierarchy. So if you're at the top of the hierarchy, it's great. If you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, you're scrapping for survival. And every bird starts at the bottom and works their way up. So your, whether what your genetics are, what your attitude is, that's going to determine how, how far you go up. What's on the brink of extinction? So pretty much, you know, I mean, I always tie it with the gold rush. You know, there was just the Western boom and people came out in droves and anything that got in their way got wiped out, whether it was grizzly bears, you know, especially in California with the gold rush, um, uh, buffalo, you know. A lot of species of birds just were disappearing, were just decimated. And the same went for the condor. They were hunted for sport. Um, they were indirectly poisoned as part of grizzly bear poisoning campaigns, which were rampant because the grizzly bears were taking the cattle, which were taking the hides that they depended, all the settlers were depending on. Um, and just the loss of natural foods, everything was being displaced. Um, the fur trade completely wiped out the food sources on the coast. So they had the rug pulled out from under and there. And then you add to it the poisoning, and then you add to it the inland, the native ungulates were being replaced by cattle and sheep and everything else. So they, they were, it was a very short period, and it was a huge disruption. And again, you got this long-lived, slow-breeding species that basically had the rug pulled out from them. They, they got wiped out just by in numbers. You know, Lewis and Clark found them along the Columbia River in the early 1800s. And we estimate by the early 1900s, they were restricted to Central and Southern California. They just got hammered. And unfortunately, the data from those early explorers is very anecdotal. It was just written in their diaries. We see these huge, large birds feeding in the coast of Monterey. This was in 1600. You know, these huge birds feeding on these huge whales. So it wasn't very scientific. Lewis and Clark were the first to really collect scientific data on condors. They collect, actually collected four specimens. And so we know they were there. And to know that they were that far up in the Northwest, we know their population must have been in the thousands. Um, so by the time these guys got done, you know, we're in this maybe 60, you know, so it's pretty scary. And that's when, in 1967, they estimated roughly there were 50, 60 condors left. They listed them endangered. Um, they were one of the earliest species listed as endangered. And by 1987, you know, they had kicked in efforts to save the species. It was very controversial. And they captured the last free-flying wild condor in 1987. And so all the condors that existed were in captivity, and there were only 27 left. <clears throat> Pretty scary. That's as close as you can get to extinction. <clears throat> and so the, the part you start thinking about is, of those 27, how, much, how many genetics are you know? And how are the genetics? Is it just one male and that represents everybody? You know, so a lot of species bottleneck like that, and it's a, they actually don't, can't, you can save them, but the genetics are lost. So um, fortunately, we got very, we hit the lottery of the condors. Of those 27, 14 were unique. You know, basically they came from different tribes around. 
So we got very lucky. When I talked to the geneticist at Smithsonian Institute that oversees our condor genetics, she describes as that. She goes, you guys have the lottery. She works with species that did the same thing, and they have one <laughs> And she said, that's oh. pretty scary. So they strategically paired these birds in the zoo to optimize genetics, and they were able to get the species um, rolling again. Uh, and then by the late 80s, they had birds ready for release. They had the species mm. kind of, the, in captivity, the species was kind of stabilized. And they said, okay, let's start getting birds back out. Oops, sorry about that. Can everybody hear me okay? No. Yeah, yeah. just holler. So when and where did the releases uh, start? Uh, you know, there we go, Nin 1991, the captive flock, flock was at 100. They said, let's start getting some of these young guys out. Obviously, the first place they went was where the last bird was captured, Southern California. That was the last stronghold of the species. Um, Arizona, I have highlighted in blue and Baja. Uh, they're not part of the endangered species recovery plan. They're experimental populations, but they still contribute to the overall recovery. So the ones in black are the ones that are, that are uh, putting towards the actual California recovery of condors in California and getting them off the endangered species list. So that would be us. We came on board in 1997. Uh, we brought Pinnacles on board and partnered with them in 2003. And in 2015, we expanded our releases down the coast, down here to San Simeon. And here's a map. This is kind of the best way to look at it. You can see Arizona over there, the experimental population. And then you see the core of releases that are happening in California there. And those are kind of all Big Sur, San Simeon, Pentacles, and then Southern California. And that's to reestablish that historic range that the Condors once occupied in Central and Southern California. And of course, Baja has a partnership with Mexico and to get them involved. And at one day, we hope that all three will intersect. All these three populations will come together. <laughs> we're, we're ways out from that, but um, the Baja birds have actually come up into California. So it's pretty cool. And Arizona's have come closer over in the Nevada in that area. So here's a, a zoom in of California. You can see where the different release sites are. There's Hopper Mountain. There's Baker. You guys see where Bakersfield, I-5, 101. There's San Simeon, Big Sur, and Pinnacles. Um, how are Congress released to the wild? So when I started in 96, they didn't really know how to do it. Um, Actually, Dana's father was one of the earliest biologists to work with California condors, Mike Wallace. I had to call him up there. <laughs> she has a good pedigree there. <laughs> Her dad developed a lot of the techniques we have for releasing. So when I started, he was, he was refining a lot of the techniques, and we were still learning. And he was really encouraging us to try different stuff. And so we came up with the idea of these large holding pens, big bird, very large. But you just don't want to let them out. You want to give them a little bit of time to acclimate. Because they're with their mom and dad after they leave the nest for a year. So how can we mimic that? You know, so we would get the birds from captivity about six months. And we'd hold them for up to a year, letting them acclimate, letting them get used to uh, being a condor, building up their confidence. And then the other thing we did was added, brought up an adult as a role model. Just to kind of, because leaving condors to their own devices, young condors to their own devices in a flight pen is kind of like a word. Yeah. It's just like when you leave a group of kids unmonitored in a room, <laughs> it, goes, it goes crazy pretty quick. Cutters are no different. So having that adult role model is really, really important. And you can see the different pen styles. On the left is Pentacles. On the right is our Big Sur pen. It's another angle to Big Sur pen. You can see older birds that have been released come back and see the new guys that are about to get released. You can see them milling around inside the net. And that was something that was really cool. After we started releasing, we had the benefit of older birds coming back and helping teach the younger ones. So it was kind of a domino effect in terms of the birds started helping us. You know, the flock started strengthening itself. And here's the San Simeon pen, a little smaller. Um, we now, the birds come up to us at an older age. The zoos are able to hold them longer and prepare them. So we have to prepare them less in the wild. So they're socially more ready to go. And what we do is just acclimate them to the site. So they're getting to us, I want us out a year and a half. And so we hold them for a couple months, three, two, three months, and let them out. And again, I just, the best way to think of it is just condor prep school. You know, and they gotta graduate. <laughs> and some birds, you know, we hold on to a little longer. They just, they, they take a little longer to get, get to the, with the program. And some birds are just ready to go. And uh, 
And again, they're just curious. They're, they're kind of developing a pecking order within their little group, which is really cool to watch. And uh, Dana and Mackenzie can kind of tell us about the current cohort, how that pecking order is shaken out. But again, up there on the le that top left photo, that says it all. That's the mentor, and there's the the basically it's it's kind of adopted kid <laughs> that it's watching over, and they will not do anything without that mentor's approval. Mm -hmm. So you can see, you realize how important that is, and it's the same when we see these wild chicks with their parents. They really need that tutelage. They definitely need that that mentoring, and then the wild mentors coming in is really awesome. I mean, for these older birds to come in and and they immediately want to be with those birds, even though they don't really realize how rough it's going to be when they, they get released and there's no cage between them and those these really dominant birds. So they're kind of seeing some of that up the San Simeon side right now. So it's kind of bittersweet. They want to be and follow the, the dominant birds, but when they do get out there, they get a reality check really quick. <laughs> and then we release, you know, these birds graduate, so to speak, from the prep school and out they go and you know and that's that's the hardest part for us because you no longer have any control they fly where they want they go where they want and uh, it's uh, so we lean on technology to help us there what you know what happens to these birds after we let them go where do they go so you gotta have some tools of the trade and the big things we're trying to do are confirm whether they live or live or die survive or die where they go, where, what trees are they using, what places do they go feed, and where are they nesting? I mean, those are the three biggies uh, for the condor. And so we have some tools that we use. We use these colored ID tags, and she can pass, they'll pass those around. And the colors uh, coincide with age, so the different age groups of the bird. And the, uh, so the, and the number is actually a stud book number assigned by the zoo. And it's, it's a, basically a, one day we won't have to do that, but right now there's so few, we still monitor. And this, the color tags are for us, the biologists, when we see one far away, we look through a scope and go, oh, we got a red tag, we know it's one of a few birds with red tags, and you can pick out the number and read the number. So it's really helpful to us to find out what individuals are doing what. And of course, the radio tag, these have a range of about 20 to 40 miles, so those photos earlier showed, at, you, if people up around Camry have probably seen us out there with our radio antennas. It looks like those old television antennas, the, we call them Yagis. And uh, you, good chance after we release the birds, you'll see Dana and Mackenzie cruise around town with us. <laughs> so if you see them, go up and say hi. But it's how we track these radio tags. So that a radio tag emits a signal. And they last about two, three years in the wild. And that signal, that go look basically, the stronger the signal is, is more where the direction of the bird is. It's pretty intuitive. And then in the last uh, 10 years, we, uh, GPS technology has uh, taken off. And that's the other tag going around. They're solar powered. And the GPS has pretty much revolutionized wildlife track, um, whether it's condors, whales, great white sharks. Everyone's seen the Shark Week shows on Discovery Channel. They're chasing great whites around. Connors are no, nonetheless, and it's so much more efficient. We save so much more time with the GPS. They are more expensive, but at the end of the day, it gives you the, the highest quality of data, and you can manage the species more from afar, which is what we prefer. When you're radio tracking and visually seeing them, they're seeing you too. So it's nice the GPS gives a peace of mind. All the birds released at San Simeon are always start with the GPS on. Because that way we're not just running around in circles. We can look at the GPS data and go, oh, the bird's just, he's fine, he's moving around, he's just making his way. Um, are they finding enough food? Yes. The condors are really doing well on the coast. Um, the California sea lions are their favorite food. You can see here, they can render one pretty quickly. A group of 10, 15 condors can whittle down, you know, two, three hundred pound sea lion. You know, sometimes they really want it in a few hours, but sometimes it'll take a couple days. And again, they're always fighting with the tide line, you know, because those carcasses come up and they've got to kind of jump in on it and get in there. Um, and then the, the more exciting food items they find on the coast, um, and it doesn't happen that often, but this is what you'll see a lot of times. These guys are out searching for food. Any of those rocky beaches could have something washed up on it. 
And that's a big stretch from Cambria up to Big Sur. You know, basically we call Big Sur all the way up to Carmel. And it's, there's just so much going on on there, so much marine life, so many areas where the birds hang out and find food. And this is some of the more amazing sites. In 2006, this was the first time founders had been, feeding, been seen feeding on a whale since Lewis and Clark saw them at the mouth of Columbia in the early 1800s. So it was a pretty cool moment. The birds had kind of disappeared. And the GPS showed us they were hanging on this very remote beach in Big Sur. And you had to, the only way to get to it was hiking to it. And we get out there, and this is what we found. We're like, wonder driver. <laughs> But it was scary. We didn't know where they were, but they been, they fed on this whale for about six months. Oh. So it, it became a party spot. <laughs> if you, any commoner that was in the know was there. I mean, it was like a social gathering. You can see them all. This is a great, the picture on top is really great. You can see the pecking order at work. You can see the darker head birds are younger. They're waiting their turn. And the dominant birds basically give them the green light whether they can feed it's important they know that. If they don't follow that, they basically will get run out of the flock and die. They've got to know their place. Our Connor's nesting, yeah. How many people got to tune into our live, or any of the live Connor games this evening? Again, technology, uh, the webcam technology is just crazy. It's insane. And uh, So we're climbing up these redwood trees now, popping cameras in there, and we're able to beam these signals out. I don't, still don't know how we get this one out, but, um, uh, I get some volunteer, IT volunteer guys in Big Sur to help. They try to get people internet in these really remote places, and we use that same skill set to have them figure out how to get these condor images out. And it's worked really well. So yeah, our first nest was in a redwood, and that was the first time um, it had ever been documented they, of a condor nest in a coastal redwood. We know they nested in them, but it had never been documented anywhere in history. They were documented in the 80s nesting in a giant sequoia inland, which is a cousin of the coastal river. So we knew it wasn't a, you know, it was, it was cool, but it was kind of understood that we knew they would probably use the redwoods. And redwoods are the most preferred uh, nest in Big Sur on the coast. Yeah. Um, since nesting began, with right now we're up to over 50 chicks that have fleshed in the wild. 23 of those survive, and that's about right. You're gonna get about 50% survival no matter what bird species with your young. So that we feel like we're doing pretty good there. And again, redwoods are the preferred nest. This is a just great shot of the different nest cavities. Um, the, I like this shot because you can really see the burn scars. So these nests wouldn't be there unless those fires had hollowed them out and burned them. So in a way, condors again have another symbiotic relationship with fire and redwoods. They need fire and the redwoods need fire to actually reproduce. And so that it's a really cool thing to see them utilizing these so heavily. <coughs> and anybody see where that nest is? <laughs> <laughs> this is our most remote nest site. It's out in the middle of the Ventana wilderness. But we took a helicopter in to get to this one. There it is, right there. So this pair nested for the first time in 2008. We had a big wildfire that busted out in 2008, the basin complex. Fire completely burned through. This is after the fire burned this whole grove. You can't see the lower 100 feet, but it's just charred black. And they had a chick in there, and it survived. Wow. We climbed up the tree expecting to recover a carcass of a chick, and we were greeted by a very feisty <laughs> condor that was not happy to see us. It just survived a fire. It was, and so we aptly named that bird Phoenix. <laughs> and Phoenix is just nested this year and just fledged a chick. So things are coming really full circle for us. Uh, Connor's nesting caves too, or you know, as you go inland to Pinnacles, the pairs that settle down over near Pinnacles obviously are using caves. And again, it's a cavity. They're looking for a nice dry cavity spot. They don't build nests. They find a nice dry spot and they, if anything, they groom a nest, they clean it up. And like this is a classic kind of sandstone cave. Um, it's way bigger than it looks. Like if, it, if I had a human perched on there, I could stand up in that cave. So mm -hmm. just to give you a perspective of the. How far are they flying? I mean, we have birds. This, this, we would only know this with the GPS. This is a GPS track that came back to us 
And this was about a 10-day flight. And this bird covered 650 miles, it left Big Sur, went all the way to Southern California, that's just right above LA, hmm. in the mountains there, turned around, came back, blew by Big Sur, went all the way up to Livermore. <laughs> turned around, came back, went over to Pinnacles, and then finally made it back to Big Sur. Hmm. So just, and that was just on, and that was a younger bird, you know, so that we know when they want it, they can, they can really be. I mean, it's pretty impressive. And it, again, the GPS data, it's showing us these, these really, which is really important um, with wind turbine technology coming out. We're able to see and verify that, thankfully, condors stay well above the rotor heights of those windmills, but we, we're keeping a close eye on it. Obviously, you know, you got to meet in the middle sometimes with some of these newer, cleaner technologies coming out. Um, but fortunately, like Soledad does have a couple wind turbines, and we've never, never seen them come within 1,000 feet. Um, so they're obviously seeing them and staying high, and they go right over those to go to Pinnacles from Big Sur. So they're navigating. You can see how high up this bird was, and made its way over to Pinnacles. Uh, it's really been really, really valuable with us understanding how they feed, especially inland. We know on the coast how they've been feeding, but inland's really challenging. Um, they can go down and feed and be gone from a carcass by the time you get there. You just you don't know what happened. So the GPS is leaving, letting us know, oh, they did land, and they were feeding in this farmer's field. And the first thing I think of is they're probably feeding on ground squirrels or varmints the rancher shoot, you know, which is something ranchers do. There's not anything illegal about it. It's just something they do to depredate and, and uh, keep the, the ground squirrels down on the ranch. And this is when we started realizing, we started getting more and more data like this. We're like, oh my god, they're feeding on these var these smaller carcasses way more than we think. And uh, it ties in later. Here's a couple feeding events. And they were on the ground, ground level, just for extended periods. So the results of our releases to date, uh, we've re released over 131. Currently, we have 56 in Big Sur. We've released um, 59 over at Pentacles and 16 over in San Simeon. Um, 41 total have perished of those 131. And um, we are at, so there's perspective. We were at 27 and 87. We're now over 290 in the wild. Um, and what's really cool is we have over 170 in California with 90 of those in Central California. Mm -hmm. That's a real testament. 38 in Baja, 82 in Arizona, and the experimental population, which is really cool. Um, but that's, you know, coming from the 27 and the genetics are great. Um, we got them feeding on their own. We've got them doing all the right things. A lot of people felt like the birds were going to forget how to do all that. So it was nice confirmation to get these birds released out there and let them do their thing. They know where to go. You know, they're they were out there for thousands of years. They know, they know how to do it. So that's a real relief. So where are we in the recovery status? So I told you they're listed endangered. This is the criteria we need to downlist them. This is just to make them threat. We don't even have a, uh, we don't even have criteria for completely delisting them. But these numbers would probably be in the thousands for that to happen. But right now, it's a sign of the times that we're actually looking at potentially downlisting. And we're not quite there yet, but we've hit two of the major. Mm -hmm. We've got um, over 150 birds in the wild and 150 in, cap in captivity. And then we have over 15 breeding pairs in the wild. And in captivity, we probably have 40 to 50 pairs. So we're well beyond the, um, we've hit, hit the mark big time on that. But the big one right here is this positive growth rate. Are they surviving? Are more birds dying than surviving? And we work with modelers at UC Santa Cruz and these other academia, and they run, they call them popul population viability models. And they're really um, the standard right now for assessing the, the strength of a population. And the models are clearly stating that we have a negative decline in our flock. And as biologists, we know what's causing it. And um, this is the big one. So we know very clearly that this is the biggest threat to condor growth. And that self, oh, sorry, that self sustainability check that we need to hit, that last benchmark. And this is the number one uh, issue that's preventing condors from sustaining themselves. 
We monitor blood. We've been monitoring blood levels in Congress since we started releasing. It's a really intensive process, but we usually let complement when we got to switch the radio tags out or do some other maintenance on the birds. When we're in that moment, we'll take a blood sample and check it to see how high their leads are. Um, early in the program, we did a real intensive treatment. Any bird that had any lead in it, we would take them into the hospital. And it's just a really intensive treatment. Um, Connors don't show clinical signs necessarily, even though they are poisoned. Uh, what we found, if they start to show clinical signs like this poor bird, they're pretty much on their way out. And so what the zoos do is try to give them a, a, a humane death. And try to, they try to save them, but um, on the, you know, I had a veterinarian here, she explained it, but once they start to shut down, uh, it's kind of an irre irreversible process. They've only been able to pull it off a couple times. It's just they, their bodies basically start to cave in on themselves. So the resources needed to treat this one bird and give it a humane death are just lopsided with the rest of the effort we can do. So we knew this is something we can't sustain. We cannot sustain uh, this level of resources, this level of treatment, if this flock's going to make it. Um, and surgeries, I mean, eight, ten hour surgeries to save some of these birds, remove the lead from them. Um, full blood transfusions, I can't even tell you the amount of resources that LA Zoo, um, Oakland Zoo exert on, we bring them birds and they do these valiant efforts to save them and they, end of the day, a majority aren't making it. So it's even, it's super heartbreaking is, is what it comes down to. This is what it looks like. So this is a bird we captured, um, 318. Uh, he was nesting at Pinnacles. He had raised a couple chicks. Uh, we caught him and he was, because he was acting really funny, he had dropped in the hierarchy, which is a real cue to us that why is this dominant bird now at the end of the totem pole? So we caught him, and when we radiographed him, we saw this, that white object, which any metal shows up as white on the, on the radiograph. And when we pulled it out, we sent it up to Fish and Wildlife to their forensic lab, and they identified it as a 22 short rifle round, which is the most common rifle round used for clinking squirrels, that sort of thing. You know, the brand, it's a go-to for any rancher um, and any hunter out there going to plant. And it confirmed what we saw in the GPS data, that we saw these birds going around and feeding on these varmints, and it made us realize, wow, they're picking up a lot of lead from these feeding events, not necessarily on the coast. You know, and I guess, you know, it's, it's not, it's definitely more rare to have a sea lion shot than it would be a ground school out the pedicle. This is what it looks like, you know, this is the other form, even the large rifle calibers of lead bullets, even though they're copper jacketed, they expand and just shrap and turn into a big shrapnel field. And that was the amount of lead pulled out of that shoulder of that deer. And you can see how much is there. It's just one little, one of those little fragments gets through into a condor digester tract and they're done. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, so a condor comes up on a carcass, it's been shot. Condors are very efficient. They go right into the wound channel. They're not going to tear through the, why spend that extra energy? They go right into the path of least resistance. So it's this really nasty cycle that, and, and say a squirrel is shot, they just eat the whole thing whole. A condor will swallow a whole squirrel and cough up the bits later, you know. But they'll go down, if they're in a field where they feel vulnerable, they'll just swallow it, take it back somewhere, and then finish it off. So it's, it's and wild pigs are another one, but we really thought it was the big game, but then we, we started looking again back at this data, and that's when we realized it was these squirrels and other varmints, coyotes, these smaller um, animals were really the <coughs> biggest uh, target. So non-lead ammunition is the alternate to lead, and the good news is it's ballistically awesome. It's a very good shooting bullet. Um, it's slightly more expensive, but it is an alternative to lead. And we presented our data, our conger data and other data on wildlife, other rappers that were getting poisoned by lead. Uh, we submitted to the state and they banned lead in 2008 in the conger range. And then they expanded the lead and it goes to effect this next summer um, to all of California. And again, this is not only for congers, it's to protect all wildlife. And you know, the pattern with lead has been, whether it's in your gasoline, whether it's in your paint, it's bad. I don't care where it is. And if there's a potential, if you're, and especially if you're subsistence hunting, you're eating the animals you're shooting, 
you know, if you're a deer hunter or a pig hunter, it's a major red flag. I, I tell my friends that hunt, I'm like, you should look at this data because there's a lot of lead left behind in the meat. And, um, and would you, you know, if you have kids and you're feeding this meat to your kids, would you take that chance? I would. I wouldn't take that chance with my kids that I could potentially expose them to lead. So again, it's, I think it's just a, um, the good news is there's a, a very, the copper bullets were made for hunters. They were, this wasn't a, in response to the thing. These copper bullets have been out there because they were thought to be ballistically superior. So we think as availability in California goes up and, and supply and demand shifts, that the price will come down. And even right now, some calibers are already the same, some of the more common calibers. And then the, um, the biggest challenge is the smaller varmint type 22 bullets. That's the, that's the one that we're having the hardest availability with. So we, in response, knowing that getting hunters to switch and ranchers to switch to non-lead was the biggest thing we could do to help conquer the lead issue, we initiated a, a free non-lead program. And since 2012, we've um, given out over a quarter million in free non-lead to hunters in California. And that basically equivalates to 4,000 boxes of free non-lead in them. And there's no better way to, because a lot of these guys, you, you go to handle the bullets, they want to get this political debate. I'm like, this isn't political, right? Like, just, these are free bullets for you to use. They're ballistically proven. You, whether you want to do it for the right reasons or not, you know, and basically, because a lot of them were on the defensive, they thought we were trying to take their hunting rights away. And so it was, it's clear when you hand them a box of bullets, which is something as a, working for the Town of Wildlife Society for Connors, I never thought I'd see the day I'm giving out bullets. <laughs> it's just weird, you know, but you know, when you get down to brass tacks, you know that's what it takes. And so the, uh, and I talked to Christine a lot about it. Everyone knows Christine writes, and she's been um, trying to get some articles published about this issue. and. Uh, and I've always talked to her about that. That interface with the rancher and the hunter is always very interesting because they definitely want to make it a political thing. They want to make it, they, they get very defensive. And I can see both sides. You know, I can see it's a regulatory thing that's kind of thrown upon them. Totally sympathize for that. But at the end of the day, this is still the right thing to do. And it's, and it's just good for the whole ecosystem. And it's, at the end of the day, I think it's good for the um, I talked about the bird feeding on the coast. It isn't a complete, clean, Awesome thing. There are contaminants still persisting um, in the marine food supply, and it's stuff that basically it's DDE from 40 years ago that's still persisting in the marine food web. Amazingly, they dumped so much off Southern California at that Superfund site off Palos Verdes, the um, Montrose chemical plant off the Channel Islands. It's so inundated in the food web down there. All the sea lions that Congress feed on on the coast up here come have bred in the Channel Islands. They basically were either born or actually bred themselves in this highly contaminated area. Good news is the, there are no new inputs of DDT, DDE. Oh, and I should have explained that. DDE is the breakdown oh, metabolite oh, of DDT oh, that causes eggshell thinning in birds. And so when I, uh, and sea lions contain high amounts of DDE. So while they're finding this awesome natural food source, <laughs> again, another human contaminant element not only comes in and it's much brighter uh, than the lead issue in that we know there's no more inputs of DDT. DDT's been banned for 40 years, that this is just basically gotta ride it out. And the good news is the data on sea lions is showing that DDT is declining. It's just very slow. And, uh, and even with the condors, not all condors are suffering from eggshell thinning. Certain birds that just only feed on the coast and don't diversify their diet seem to have the thinnest shelled eggs, but even just showing how resilient the species is, even some of these thin shell eggs still hatch. And I mean, just showing how tough condors are, they're just, their eggs are tough, they're tough. <laughs> they can handle a lot of what we throw out, throw at them, but lead doesn't discriminate. Lead will kill them pretty quickly. Um, we also clean up, you guys all live here on the coast, you see the amount of trash that ends up on the pullouts on the coast. Um, early on in the project, one of our first nesting pairs the chick died from impaction of trash that the birds found along the coast on the pullouts. And it was just little bottle caps and real superficial stuff that you would never think would kill a chick. And it's a small window when these chicks are developing from about 30 to when they're about one to three months old, they can swallow stuff and they can't cough it up. So adults can swallow stuff, but they don't like it, they can cough it up. 
they haven't built that they haven't built that ability yet. So there's a small window there that we saw that these birds were vulnerable. So we've done in Big Sur and in San Simeon, we've led these volunteer cleanups. And uh, I don't know if anybody participated in the ones down here, but we have them going. We we kick them into gear. We work with Caltrans. It's part of the uh, Caltrans cleanup program down the highway. Um, so anytime you guys ever want to help, we have fun doing it. We usually always see condors when we go out and see it, so it's kind of, a, that's the uh, perk is you come out and clean up, you usually can uh, find the birds for you. Um, so if we continue to reduce, reduce lead, it's pretty much that simple. Um, if we can get this, this ban in place that's about to happen in two, that summer 2019, I really feel confident we'll get over the hump. And that we'll see more of this. We'll see more, more breeding, more survival, more sustainability, and we'll see those, these birds get downlisted, the threat. And I feel we're really, really close. We're already seeing a change with our free non-lead program. We're starting to see lead levels in general drop in the flock, which is really encouraging. So we think when the ban kicks into effect, there's always going to be dissenters, people that probably have a stockpile of lead. But what the, really, the model has told us that we just need to put a dent in it. And those birds will start to gradually start to that positive growth rate that we need to do list. So it's pretty exciting. So our live streaming, uh, Connor Cam is a hit. Uh, every, Pasquale was our, our chick, and it was named by two girls that were his number one fans. <laughs> and they wrote this adorable letter. It was two sisters writing the letter together. She was... Uh, Madeline was six and the older sister was um, nine and they wrote, they wrote this banter back and forth in the letter and at the end they wanted to name the bird Pasquale because he was born right near Easter. And Pasquale in French, uh, or I forget the meaning is, of Easter. So it was a really cool, so we, we, we had no other choice. We had no other choice. Pasquale. They couldn't have been a girl. We don't know the actual gender yet of Pasquale. But Pasquale fledged. You know, we, the, Live cam caught it happening. Mm -hmm. uh, actually documented him leaving the nest and uh, he, she leaving the nest. And last seen a couple weeks ago, just on a ridge right above the nest with mom and dad being fed. And he's, the pattern is they'll just follow them further and further away from the nest site. Again, mom and dad will be with that shit for the next year, showing at the ropes. And they kind of introduce it to the flock because there's some ruffians in the flock that they definitely have to be escorted in. And they're, they're in it's a good thing if they're in the presence of mom and dad. Um, and we just updated our website. So these are the two sites we we partnered. This was huge with Explore.org for our cam. They caught wind of our cam and said, we want to put it on our site. They're a nonprofit as well, but they have a huge audience. Um, our cam is right next to the NASA's International Space Station cam. It's pretty awesome. And then they have these cams of grizzly bears feeding in Alaska. So it's a real honor to get picked up by these guys. And they gave us a grant to um, help keep our cams going. So it's, it's a win-win kind of situation. And uh, right now the cam is off the nest and back on the, the sanctuary, which is where we release them. And you can see the wild birds coming in and out. And um, you can go to the different, uh, we have so many birds now, you definitely, you need an app to figure out who they are if you're just an onlooker. Um, this was a video, but I think because uh, switch computers, it won't play, but this was a time lapse of, this is the cam catching right after hatch, I mean right after the egg was laid. This is the first time we saw the egg on the cam. You can see it right under the male's beak. And there is a time lapse video here, but it didn't, yeah, it's not long, but this was a funny, uh, uh, Pasquale bounced around inside the nest, flying around, sorry, it's not playing, but I might be able to do it after the talk. So let's get into San Simeon, and Dana and Mackenzie can get in here too and start helping, but we like San Simeon, obviously the birds were utilizing most of Big Sur, but there was, they were jumping over to Pinnacles and kind of bypassing San Simeon. And San Simeon has the elephant seal colony down here that is huge, and we know that could be a potential awesome long-term food source. And elephant seals are less contaminated than sea lions, so that's another bonus. Um, so San Simeon is very attractive, and we know over time the birds would eventually find it down here anyway, but we had an opportunity with the private landowner to, um, to put a little release site down here and get them, kind of grease the wheels a little bit and get the birds coming down here. 
there's something about when you release, a, release birds in an area, they become sight tenacious. They want to come back to that specific area, whether to nest or to um, spend, basically spend the rest of their lives. And, but yeah, the elephant seals were a big thing. Just large tracks, you know, you got all of Hirsch Ranch, you've got a lot of protected, open, beautiful, obviously you guys know, beautiful landscape. I mean, it's awesome condor country. And very low hunting pressure compared to maybe Pinnacles, some of these areas inland where the hunting's really rampant. Um, so we figure it's got lower lead exposure. So we've released 16 condors so far. And um, 13 of those survive and have merged with Big Sur and Pinnacles flocks. So they're all one flock. You know, San Simeon, Big Sur, Pinnacles, they all mix now. But what's really cool is these, the San Simeon flock are bringing other birds back down here. And um, we have the six condors that are away in release, and we're gonna talk about them in a little bit. Um, and then the big question is, have they started nesting yet? And what, what, was, what happened, which kind of caught us off guard, is when we started releasing in 2015, it's back to the hierarchy. These birds from Big Sur, this up and coming young pair who weren't dominant enough to nest in Big Sur came down here and went, whoa, there's some young birds down here. We should set up camp here where we can dominate. <laughs> and they did. So it was really, it wasn't planned, but it was really cool to see. It was another learning lesson about the hierarchy that these were two birds that weren't even released down here, but the presence of young birds in an area um, will draw uh, birds that are kind of up and comers to come down, and they nested. Uh, they attempted twice. Uh, the first time they failed in the egg stage, we don't know, we, we never could figure out, unless we, get, we couldn't get to this cave that was on private property. Um, and the second time, we're fairly confident they had a chick and it died somewhere along the way. And again, this is normal for long-lived birds to kind of fail the first couple times, you give it a go. But the coolest part was it was the first attempt in Slow County in 60 years. So it kind of broke the threshold. That was kind of one of our big goals for drawing the birds down in the San City to open them up and even get them to go a little further south over to Huff's Hole and uh, Black Mountain in that area. Really great habit. Those are all historical condor areas. And the spot they picked here was a historical, supposedly an area where they used to collect condor eggs. So we're pretty sure they probably picked an old condor cave that was once used by the historical flock. Um, unfortunately, the female perished last summer. Um, and the, the, the good news is the male is on the lookout for another mate. And he's sticking around. He was just there the other day, right, when we were up there. And uh, so the male is still around, and we're, we don't know who he's going to pair with, but there's a lot of bachelor females out there, so we're coming into nest season. Nest season kicks in around December, January, so we'll, we'll have a better idea of who he's looking at, and hopefully they go back to that same nest site. Uh, we assume they will, so it's pretty exciting. Here's, uh, here's the group that's out there now, the 13 that are, that are out there. Mm -hmm. And again, you can look these birds all up on our MyCondor.site. Mm -hmm myconder.org to get all their personalities, but we use different things to name them. Um, we went with the famous airplanes, famous aviators, like we got Orville and Wilbur Wright up there. <laughs> we got Apollo, uh, and then we went with Greek gods, we got Poseidon in there, and then a bird named 7-Eleven, where we got to call him Big Gulf. <laughs> <laughs> so we have fun with it, um, and then the last round there at the bottom was a Game of Thrones theme going on. <laughs> so these guys have fun with it, and they've, uh, they've got a theme going for this next batch, which is pretty funny. Um, here's some cool movements. Uh, I like to show what these birds are doing that are released here. You know, they not only hang out down here, but these are movements of this bird checking out pinnacles and Big Sur. This is Wilbur. He's still out and about. Here's a cool flight, literally going straight up the coastline, literally following, almost following Highway 1, just going up and then decided to go over toward Pinnacles, but turned around at King City. Probably got scared of that big valley right there. Yeah. It takes a while for them to build up the bravery to get up there. And again, another cool flight up around Ragged Point in those hills, you know, kind of skirt up around 400 Liggett. Um, you see the lakes there. There's San, San Antonio, Nacimo. Now, without further ado, Dan and Mackenzie are going to talk about the new batch. Because they've been watching the most, so they, they have some good tips.
tidbits on. Okay, yeah, so he mentioned that um, each batch of condors generally has a theme. Um, for this batch, um, earlier on, we, sorry, <laughs> um, we actually had a uh, wild young bird, um, 892, who had to be taken into um, the veterinarian just because he had some suspicious scabs on his head. He's totally fine, <coughs> not really much to worry about. But um, people started calling him Scabbers while he was there, which is a character in the Harry Potter series. So we decided to go with that. Um, so 875, her name is Tonks. Um, she's very energetic. She likes bouncing from perch to perch. She's not very coordinated. I've seen her fall off the perch multiple times, um, run into a couple of walls when she gets very excited. Um, but she's pretty good natured, um, kind of like in the middle of the hierarchy. She doesn't really mess with too many people, but they also don't seem to mess with her all that much. Um, 881 is Minerva, after Minerva McGonagall. Um, if anyone's read the books or watched the movies. Um, she is relatively high in the hierarchy. She is pretty calm, usually doesn't uh, pick on anyone, but she doesn't let anyone pick on her either. Um, she's a little sassy. And uh, like the one bird that she seems to hang out the most with is, we sort of decided probably the highest in the hierarchy. Um, She'll be coming up later on. She's 889. Um, 888 is Cedric. Um, he's kind of right in the middle. We named him after Cedric Diggory, who, um, if anyone's read the books, he's a Hufflepuff. They're known for, uh, like, um, essentially being good friends with everyone, like hardworking, does well cooperating with others. Um, he doesn't really mess with anyone, and no one messes with kind of just in his little corner and does his own thing, but it seems to work for him. Alright, so um, Narcissa, as uh, Dana mentioned, is our 889. She is the queen of the, of the birds. And she's named after Narcissa, the very prominent mother of the Malfoy family. So she is like the prominent mother of all of these guys. She like definitely bosses all of the birds around. And you can always see her uh, sitting at her favorite place, which is on the scale on the left hand uh, picture. You can see her sitting on her perch, the scale. <laughs> and then it's the highest perch. It's the, yes, it's the highest perch. And then um, 890 is our little uh, kind of, um, hmm. uh, well, as his name uh, is, if you have ever, again, read the books or watched the movies, um, there's this owl character in um, the stories, and he's known for just flying into the windows all the time. He's not very coordinated at all. And so his name is Pig Widgeon, and uh, he's so very excitable. He sprints around everywhere, and he thinks he's also stronger than uh, most of the other birds as well. And so he, when there's turkey vultures around, he'll actually brush them um, and fly at them at the pen and stuff. Oh, that's good. Yes. And then uh, finally, we have Sirius Black. He's our bad boy uh, bird of the um, of the crew, and he's named after the very uh, heartthrob, sort of mysterious character in the Harry Potter series. Uh, yeah. So he basically um, is uh, like an antagonizer of the many uh, many of the other condors as well as the older birds that come in to check out on the flight. He will actually be seen rushing them as well as the other turkey vultures. And then um, when he's not um, up to his little old games, he can actually be uh, seen canoodling with some of the other birds. <laughs> he's very much a lady pleaser, so yes. <laughs> and those are uh, the new uh, birds to look out for this year. Yeah, and uh, like I, at my other talks too, I, people have always ask, what, what do you do if you have a condor show up? And, you know, so we, we were hopeful that all these birds would do well, but they do do some odd things sometimes. You know, they come down in a neighborhood and will hang out for a few days. And, you know, and your first, you obviously get concerned. We get concerned. But, again, you know, looking on the longer picture of these birds, it's usually nothing. They're just checking it out. But if you do see them take that next step, like, say, they're in a tree and now they're inside your garage, that, 
that's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> or if they're trying to get in your house, that would not be a good thing. It happens on a rare occasion. We get a we get a, a misfit bird. We don't know why, but every once in a while you get one that's not quite all there. And uh, that's not that they're they're doomed for captivity the rest of their life. We usually just bring them in and hold them for a little bit, hit the reset button, and give them another shot. Uh, and there's usually more at play than what you can see. They might be getting a red tail, might be you know on their tail all the time. There's just other stuff that's going on. You don't, we don't necessarily see. So it's not. It's not uh, we just want to get to them fast so we can get them and they don't get too many uh, positive. trying to do good and they actually end up hurting the birds in terms of feeding them and doing stuff like that. So definitely don't feed them. It's good just to get a hold of us as fast as we can. Um, Dan and Mackenzie will be out tracking these birds around. I guarantee they'll be right behind it. When that bird shows up at your house within about an hour, they'll be around with their radio tracking equipment and uh, you can just engage them. And they, they'll want to know what the bird's been up to, if it's been doing anything. But so far we haven't had that happen with any of our sand semi releases, but I like to put that disclaimer out. Uh, let us get in there because we can uh, get them out of there quick and help preserve their behavior and keep them going. I just have a last slide. We can ask more questions after this. I just want to kind of wrap up the talk real quick. You can ask them questions, myself questions. Uh, we have a VWS Discovery Center up in Big Sur. It's more, it comes to life in the summer. But we've added some cool stuff to it. We have this Condor Flight Simulator. We worked with a company that took our GPS data <coughs> It uses uh, Xbox Connects and it maps your body and you can you can actually fly like a condor. It has all the terrain. You can actually fly over this this computer generated terrain. My kids have done it and they love it. They're obsessed with it. Where is that? This is in Big Sur at Andrew Malera State Park. Thank you. And if you go to our website, we have um, I brochures here. You can there's a lot of info. But I just wanted to point out that it is more of a summer thing. If you come on one of our tours, which are year round. We usually open up the Discovery Center for the tour. So it's, it's kind of a perk of going on one of our condor tours, which is on our next slide. And these are the coolest way to come out and see the condors. You get to come with one of us. Um, typically, up in Big Sur, to be Christy, Amy, or Melissa, or myself, and, uh, or Mike Stake, who's also on our crew. And we know all the birds. You know, we know the, we know the layout. It's, I mean, you, can't, you can definitely go up and see them on your own. But it's kind of fun to come with us because we can kind of give you the background story of all the birds and tell you as we drive along, we can kind of touch, point out different areas that are really important to the condors and that good stuff. Um, lots of partners. We don't, we don't do this alone. We depend heavily on the zoos. We depend heavily on the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Parks. Obviously, the birds spend a lot of time in the forest, in the Forest Service. Fishing game with permits us on a state level. Hunters love nesting in the state parks <laughs> up in Big Sur. We have three nests in one small state park, Julie Pfeiffer Burns. Pretty amazing. Uh, and again, the researchers we work with um, at UC Santa Cruz and other, again, we're working at the University of Montana, Colorado right now and, uh, with the modeling. And then obviously, we get, we get a lot of interns from Cal Poly's program at High Mountain Lookout. And get a ton of photos from Tim Huntington. He takes amazing photos, and we get other photos from other photographers. Tim is also an awesome volunteer. He's been volunteering for us for a long time. Uh, here are the links. I have brochures at the back. Um, the Condor Spotter app Tim developed is really cool. If you see a color and a number, you can just type it in on the app on your phone, and it'll tell you what bird it is. And it's, it's pretty high tech, but everyone's got a phone now. And it's, it's a free app. You just go on. And, uh, it's on our website. And then again, from there, it links to myconder.org if you want to find out more data about the bird, when it's born, where it's from. Um, and again, for our cams, right now the nest cam, the nest season is done, but we hope to have another nest cam going next season. And it's pretty awesome to see a bird from egg to, to fledge. But that's it. Thank you so much for having us.